Here are some ideas that I came up with. First, we want to take into account the Earth's curvature. VLF waves can propagate nearly all the way around the world, or in some cases, depending on ionospheric conditions, they can propagate all the way around the world. In fact, sometimes the VLF wave from a long propagation path can be even higher than the signal from the short propagation path. So if there's a transmitter here and a receiver here, sometimes the signal will be smaller from the short propagation path than the long propagation path that goes around the other side. Fortunately, to take into account the Earth's curvature, the update equations don't actually need to change in our model. The only thing that needs to change is the dimensions of each cell in each direction. So we'd have to use spherical coordinates to figure out the dimensions of each cell and how they get uh, bigger as you go radially outward from the surface of the Earth. Second, the ground cannot always be considered a good, con good conductor, as we saw in these plots. So we should develop an SIB, SIBC formulation that doesn't rely on the assumption that the ground is a good conductor. So this relates to the SIBC formulation. Third, we decided that we need the VLF transmitters to periodically transmit at different frequencies so that at least some signals can reliably, reliably be received at any location even when there is a null for a specific frequency. As a result, we need our FTTD grid to work for different frequencies, so for different f naughts, And we would also want to develop an SIBC that is frequency dependent. Fourth, the Earth's topography could be important to take into account in some scenarios. We can account for the topography directly in the FDTD model by changing the altitude at which we implement the SIBC. So for example, if there is a mountain here, we could implement the SIBC at different heights in the model, and so these wouldn't need to be updated. Or, in this plot here, the, there's an example where a group used FDTD near the transmitter to account for this hill where the source is located, and further away, for computational efficiency, they took the fields from the FDTD grid just before you get to the PML, and they used then the parabolic equation method, PE domain here, they did this because the parabolic equation method only solves for one-way propagation, which makes it less computationally demanding. So from this example, we can see that FDTD can be coupled to other models or analytical formulations. We don't always have to use FDTD across the entire domain of interest. A fifth idea that I listed is that we should use an algorithm for the ionosphere that can take into account the geomagnetic field. That is, we want to model the magnetized ionosphere plasma. And it's magnetized by the Earth's magnetic field. The Earth's magnetic field causes the ionosphere to be anisotropic, meaning that the ionosphere affects the propagation of electromagnetic waves differently depending on which direction they are propagating in relative to the Earth's magnetic field. So instead of just having an exponentially varying ionosphere profile, sigma, which is just increases with altitude, it would be better uh, for VLF waves to take into account the Earth's magnetic field and its anisotropy. And number six, lastly, we will need a 3D FDTD model if we ever want to account for day-night transitions. So along a propagation path, if we have day here, perhaps, and then some transition, and then there's a nighttime ionosphere. To accurately account for this, especially over long propagation distances, a fully 3D model will be needed. Uh, another area where 
3D models might be helpful is if there is uh, lightning. Lightning can cause localized perturbations. So if this is a top-down view, locally, here's the transmitter and here's the receiver, along the propagation path or maybe near the propagation path, there could be a perturbation, a localized lowering of the ionosphere caused by lightning. And this can also perturb the ionosphere. And we saw that the ionosphere can greatly impact the propagation of VLF waves. We could also even create a global FDTD model, like the two examples shown here. This is actually one of the main contributions that my research group has made in the area of electromagnetic wave propagation in the Earth Ionosphere Waveguide. I started developing these models as an undergraduate student uh, working in a research lab, and this work eventually turned into my PhD thesis. And over the years since, students in my research lab have sometimes further developed these models and applied them to different research problems. Okay, well that gives us an idea of some improvements we could make to our model. Now let's finish this design challenge by talking about how we might go about implementing such a backup geolocation system. Well, it turns out that such a system was built and used in the years before satellite GPS was created. For example, a system called Omega operated between 1971 to 1997. Here is a map of the eight transmitters of the Omega system scattered around the globe, and A through H is used to distinguish between these eight transmitters. In 1993, GPS, satellite-based GPS system, was uh, turned on, was became operational for the first time. So there was some overlap where both the Omega system, which operated until 1997, and the GPS system, which started in 1993, were both operating. I even found some documents from the 1990s that mentioned that the Omega system could continue as a good backup system to GPS, but apparently it was eventually believed that Omega wasn't needed, and it was discontinued in 1997. Here is an example coverage map for a specific time of day, 1800 GMT, and time of year, in August, for the Omega system. In each region of this map, there are letters, and each letter corresponds to a transmitter. So, for example, at this time of day and this time of year, we could expect to receive signals from transmitters A, B, C, D, and F over here in much of the Atlantic Ocean. Also, as we discussed, each transmitter of the Omega system operated at a different frequency so that a receiver could unambiguously identify the transmitter sending it, and also to make, help make sure we could always receive a signal from a transmitter at any given time. This diagram shows how each of the eight transmitters, so here are eight transmitters, transmitted over 10 seconds of time. They all turn on at the same time, like here at time zero, and transmit at these frequencies listed here in the first column, and they transmit for 0.9 seconds. Then they all turn off for 0.2 seconds, and then they all turn on again with a different set of frequencies, the ends listed in the second column here. And this continued for eight segments over this 10 second time span, and then it would repeat again. So another result of this is that the Omega system could provide timing information and not just positioning information. Lastly, for this design challenge in this part of the course, we had some requirements for the backup geolocation system we wanted to develop. The first item here we've talked a lot about. For the second item, can a ground-based VLF system be easily spoofed? 